Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual tour of Jeffers Petroglyphs a Historic Site in Minnesota. I am Charity Counts, the Executive Director of AMM. I am a white woman with dark hair and eyes, and I'm wearing a green t-shirt today that says Proud Museum Person. Uh, today, I'm joining you from my home office with blue walls and white doors, and behind me is a painting of a woman with her head in her hand. Uh, because AMM is located in Indianapolis, I'd like to take a moment to pay my respects to the indigenous nations who have called these lands and waterways their home, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. Please join me in acknowledging and appreciating the stewardship of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, Shawnee, We, and Kickapoo communities. Before we begin our program, I want to share a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, first, we have turned on Zoom's built-in live transcription feature. Uh, you should be able to turn this on or off uh, in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window. Our tour guide today is David Breezy from the Minnesota Historical Society and site manager for Jeffers Petroglyphs. Uh, David and the team at the Historical Society have created a lovely video tour of Jeffers Petroglyphs to share with you today uh, due to limited con connectivity at the sacred site. Um, and he'll be ready to answer your questions in the chat or at the end of the program. Uh, virtual tours like this are a great opportunity to take a break from our other tasks in our day. Uh, please use this time to close down your email or set down your phone and take a moment to stretch, relax, and enjoy the view, or even get a little movement in as we virtually walk along with the site staff. I also want to note that today's program is being recorded and we will share it on YouTube afterward for those who weren't able to join us live today. Um, I also want to note that, you know, we'll play the video today and have this conversation. Um, you might experience some choppiness. I know that this can happen uh, depending on your internet connection and that can vary the type of day, uh, location you're in, um, but don't worry when you see that recording later, uh, it'll be you know, loud and clear and you can always watch it again if you miss something. And of course, we're happy to, to um, answer questions if you miss a point in the presentation. Um, and finally, if you haven't done so already, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're joining from today. Uh, we always like to see where everybody's uh, attending from around the country, uh, particularly in the region. Uh, and I think that's it for housekeeping. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with the program. David, I'll turn it over to you and you can introduce the video. Hi, uh, I'm David Breezy. I'm the site manager of Jeffers Petroglyphs. I am happy to be here today and share the site with everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge that Jeffers Petroglyphs and my home here in St. Peter, Minnesota uh, are part of the Dakota homeland that was stolen from the Dakota people with the Treaty of Traverse to Sioux in 1851. And today would not be possible without Charity and the AAM providing this opportunity, so I'd like to thank them. And I'd also like to thank the team that put this together uh, Cully, Chuck, Emily, Ned, and the Minnesota Historical Society. Now, to be honest, it was a difficult decision to make a virtual tour of Jeffers Petroglyphs because you'll never be able to replicate the feelings of being there in person, uh, but we tried our best. Uh, today, you're going to see an unscripted virtual walking tour of the Jeffers Petroglyphs. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Jeffers Petroglyphs. I'm David Breezy, the site manager, and today you're going to join me on a walking tour of the site. We're going to make a few stops along the way and share some features of the site, incredible views, rock carvings, and enjoy some guided interpretation from Chuck Broste. Before we get started, there's some information that will help you put the space into perspective. The Jeffers Petroglyphs is part of the Red Rock Ridge. It's located in Dakota homeland in southwest Minnesota, about two and a half hours from the Twin Cities. It seems like it's in the middle of nowhere, but we like to think it's in the middle of everywhere. This is a living place and a sacred site for many different Native peoples. This may be the oldest continuously used sacred site in North America. Native people have been visiting the site and leaving records of their interactions here for at least 10,000 years. 
There are over 8,000 rock carvings etched, packed, and abraded into the surface of the rock that represent native people from all over North America. The earliest carvings date back 10,000 years, with the latest carvings being made in the last 250 years. If you have any questions, please save them for the end. I'll be happy to answer them. So there's 160 acres of prairie out here, 33 are much remnant, and then the rest have been restored. And one of the things that we really try to fight is an invasive species you might be familiar with, which is smooth brome. And this is gonna be all the beautiful wavy grass that you see here today. It's an invasive species that was brought here by settlers because it's really quick to grow in the spring and it outcompetes native plants. So how we control and mitigate for this plant is that we do controlled burns. And once we turn around, there won't be any smooth brome. Now this is only effective for a year. And then the next year it comes right back. A rare plant. We have the largest population of prairie bush clover in the U.S. It's just starting in its bud stage and when this grows it's going to be about 12 inches taller than this. It's about two feet tall and it'll have these pink buds and it really doesn't like to seed but it's a sign of a healthy prairie. All right, so we've got to where the, the tour begins on the site, and we're gonna hand this off to Chuck, and he's gonna tell you about the rock carvings and the people that made them. Hello, my name is Chuck, and uh, here we are at the Jeffers Petroglyphs. Uh, we've got rock carvings going back for thousands of years, and we're just gonna talk about some of the highlights out here. Uh, where we are right now, we're right in the middle of about a 23 mile long outcrop of Sioux Quartzite. And it's a really hard rock. And I think one of the gifts of the place is like Sioux Quartzite is a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, you got to hear a little bit about the prairie. And one of the reasons why the prairie is so important here goes back to the, to the quartzite. Um, it's so hard that people didn't want to ruin their equipment hitting it. So we've got 30 acres of untouched prairie out here. That's a wonderful seed bank. And so it saved the prairie. It saved uh, rock carvings and it saved a multitude of different kinds of sacred sites. And we just want to look at a few of the different things going on out here. So we're at the first of a number of carved panels of rock. There are 60 or so uh, carvings around me. Uh, this area is super densely carved. And one of the things you want to be looking for uh, are tool marks. And you see all these little dings. It's sort of a pebbled texture. And all those dings are tool marks. And so now I'm just going to spray it with some distilled water. And things should start popping.
you start to see the density of carvings. Even here, there's just a little spray of tool marks that's not a representational image, uh, sort of a trident-shaped thunderbird and a stick person, a little four-legged that we think might be a baby moose and a hoof print, and lots of other shapes and symbols. I'm an archaeologist in my own background, and archaeologists have been coming here almost since the discipline was started. Theodore Lewis was actually here in 1889 and documented carvings. And it's like everybody knew that the place was important, but people didn't really know why. Why, should, why is this place such a big deal? And elders get involved, and all of a sudden, people that have a cultural lens to put the place in focus can give us an idea of it. And what they tell us is that the carvings are prayers, and they're teaching tools, and that the whole place is like an encyclopedia of Native culture. And it's hard to overstate how important that is, because for 130 years, it was pictures of stuff. And it went from being pictures of stuff to a library. And it went from being a roadside attraction to it's like, my God, this is the literature of Native people. This is Native people in the past telling us what's important to them, telling us in their own words, in their own way. And it just, it changes the game completely. Okay, so we're gonna look at a, a carving here and we see it's a, a carving, it looks like a wolf or a dog. And this is a, a wonderful example of how the cultural knowledge of elders changes how we think of the carvings. And one of the elders that helped us a lot through the years, uh, Joe Williams, he was a, a Wahpeton elder from Sisseton, South Dakota. And he said, you know, all the animals that you see out here, they're all still alive in the world and they're all, they all have attributes that help them to survive and they're teaching us how to survive. And he said, if we're smart, we can pay attention and learn from their attributes of how they survive and also how people use those attributes to communicate things. Those were intricate parts of those beings and a lot of times they could be converted into metaphors. And so one of the examples we use with school kids, it's like, well, first you gotta teach them, well, what is an attribute, you know? So it's like, well, what's the first thing you think of when you think of a turtle? It's like, well, it's got a shell. Well, what does this shell do? It protects it. What did people sometimes paint on their shields as symbols of protection? It's like turtles occasionally. And so now that turtle is not just somebody saying, oh, I'm a clever fellow that knows how to draw a turtle. It's like now that thing has gone from a picture of an animal to a symbol in its pictorial communication. So getting back to our wolf or dog, we've been looking at this for a hundred years. And without that lens of culture, it was just a picture of a critter, right? So big whoop. But now through that lens, uh, of culture, it's like we started thinking of it in terms of, well, what are its attributes? You can see that his, his back is arched. Uh, the hackles are up, the tail is up, the mouth is open, uh, the ears are up, it's a little more subtle. And it turns out that these are all the attributes of the alpha wolf. This is the leader of the pack. And so we went back to Joe and we asked him about, about wolf. Where does wolf fit in? and the stories and all. He goes, well, Wolf is a leader, right? Wolf knows things. Wolf is a person that you can go to with, with questions. And he says, we've got stories that go way back to when animals could talk. He said, way back, uh, Eagle was walking along one day and, and Eagle was always talking. And in those early days, Eagle couldn't fly and he couldn't see and he just talked, talked all the time. And he came to Wolf one day and he said, oh, Wolf, I, I, I've got this great idea. You're going to love this idea. I just I want to pitch it at you and see what you think. The stories don't say how long Eagle talked, but Eagle just talked and talked. 
And finally he wrapped it up and he goes, well, what do you, what do you think of my great idea? And Wolf goes, it's like, well, he was being polite, you know, he goes, well, I think if you listen more and talk less, you might learn something. And uh, now we might just stop the story there and just say, well, that's the punchline of a joke. But, but Joe teaches that this is a, it's a formal teaching story. And teaching stories are almost like word problems in math, where you're given all the parts of the story that you need to solve for X. And so in this story, you think about how Eagle was then and how Eagle is now, and it's like, wow. He learned how to fly, and he learned how to see, and he doesn't say nothing. And so now when we look at this carving, it's like, I, I don't know what the story is that's being told. But somebody went out of their way to put every possible visible attribute of leadership in canine society into that image um, because they're trying to teach us something. Okay, so here we are on another part of the outcrop of high and center. We're in a super dense area of carvings and we've got some different sort of carving technologies going on. And we're just gonna go down to the rock. We see a, a bright pink turtle. And right next to the turtle, there's a little stick person with this X-shaped uh, body style. And, um, Stylistically, this is, again, this is a different region, different time period of people. So we, we think these might actually be some of the last uh, carvings made out here, at least stylistically. From an archeological viewpoint, it's, it's neat. They're actually on top of older carvings, which is really rare out here. Um, all across the top of the ridge, the carvings are just dense. They're just packed in cheek by jowl. And I think without knowing what was in somebody's heart or mind when they were carving things, it really speaks to the respect and reverence of the place that nobody, very rarely do we see that anybody's carving interferes with someone else's carving, right? Nobody's putting mustaches on the Mona Lisa out here. And so, like, like I say, we've got these um, fairly late style bright carvings. And when I squirt it with water, they're gonna go away and the carvings underneath it are gonna pop out. So underneath our, our brightly packed goose tracks, we see a, an older uh, composition. So here's, here's a buffalo and an arrow. And I think it's tough to see right now but in different light I've seen there's another buffalo here and this sort of bow tie shaped thing. I don't know what it is. They show up uh, multiple places on the outcrop, but it's a tight, nice, tight little composition of four images. Here we are in yet another uh, portion of the outcrop. And there's a profile of a woman here. And it's the only profile on the site. Here's the head, I'll just draw around her head. There's her nose and her chin and her eye and her neck. And then if you follow across her neck, she's got her shoulder out here. And it's like she's got a shawl draped over her shoulder. Joe Williams, again, a Wapaton elder, uh, it's very cultural, culturally knowledgeable. And he was really interested in this particular carving. And after a while he goes, you know, I think this is oldest. It's like, I'm not sure, but I'm almost positive this is oldest. Archeologists look at this and see this Braden style A carving. And you see images of people in profile that look a lot like this. A lot of archeologists would say, this is probably made sometime between 1000 and say 1400 AD. But Joel really rejects this. He says, you know, I don't know when this carving was made. He said, but when I was young, 
I was told the story of First Woman. And I think this is First Woman. If this is First Woman, it's the first story. It's everybody's first story. It's oldest. It's like context is everything, right? Context is, is just changes everything. Thanks Chuck for the great interpretation and all that you shared. We're going to continue our journey to the prairie walk right now and we're going to head this way. Historically, this area is a birthing ground for bison. So they come here in the springtime. And like, if you look close enough at that rock, it resembles a bison. And bison has such bad eyesight and such a strong herd mentality that anything that looks like a bison, they'll come up and investigate. After a long walk on the prairie, how about let's grab a seat right here and take a moment to relax. So what we're taking a close-up look here is 
some polish and this polish was left here by bison and elk that would come to rub their coats off from winter and if they had a scratch during summer and this is about 10,000 years of wear that has made this shine and when you think about it bison carry about 10,000 seeds in their winter coat and that would all rub off here and all that plant diversity that they're carrying would spread throughout this whole region. Now that we've taken a look at the bison rub, uh, we're gonna finish our walk.
Well, thanks for coming today. I hope you enjoyed your walk around the site and learning about the carvings and the people that made them. We're gonna take a little chance to do some target practice too before we go. David, <laughs> that tour was so wonderful. Uh, thanks to you and Chuck for, and the whole team for your efforts in pulling that together. Uh, what a beautiful view and nice to see the sun setting there too. So, so, so nice. Um, I see we have a question that just came into the chat. So I wonder if you wanna answer that one live here while we have you. It says, any glyphs of extinct animals like mammoth? Um. No mammoths. We're always hoping to find a mammoth out there. Um, I have a theory about some of the circles out there because if you ever look at uh, like the dried footprints of an elephant, it will be in a circle and we have quite a few carvings out there like that, but nothing definitive. That's interesting. Well, and I'm sure that, you know, the glyphs are, you know, they're clearly different through time, right? And just stylistically different and you're right you know I don't know how you find all of the right people to talk to though to get the context you need to understand um the, the petroglyphs so um do you have like a just a huge team of advisors you're turning to regularly for uh, or researchers or what's well, the combined effort of you know of many years of people working at the site and with the site um a lot of the effort went to uh, the former site manager, uh, Tom Sanders, and his efforts to bring in that Native context. And he worked with Native American elders, you know, to bring that Native perspective in. And if we're looking for other advisors, it's, you know, we're looking for, you know, literature and written material about carvings and how they spread across the U.S. to kind of bring in that context. And, um, I wonder if anybody who watched today noticed that Chuck was wearing socks on the rock. Um, I'm guessing that there are different steps you have to take to preserve, conserve the site, right? And I figured him being in socks was one of those, but I didn't know if there were other sort of rules about accessing the, the petroglyphs themselves. Like, like are visitors able to see them up close and how do you interpret them for visitors? Um. So preservation is always a, a large concern for us. Um, the rock itself is incredibly hard. Uh, Sioux Quartzite, it's a 7.5 on the Mohs scale of mineral hardness. That's why we still see like those glacial striations in the rock um, today. So those carvings are gonna be preserved for a really long time. Uh, one of the largest threats to the carvings is lichen. And so we've done lichen mitigation in the past and we have a form of lichen that's really quick to grow um, with, you know, just dust in the air from quarries nearby and from farm fields that and it feeds the lichen and it allows to grow a lot faster than it should. Um, but people can experience the carvings a lot like today. Uh, we have two different experiences that we offer, a guided tour that's during the day, um, that provides a lot more content, a 45 minute tour. And then in the evening, um, we have a barefoot walking tour or a sock walking tour that lets you explore the whole rock. And it's more about you exploring that rock and trying to find the glyphs on your own and thinking about the place. And the reason why you see Chuck in socks is because it's a sacred space. We come at it from a sacred way. Okay, that's good. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, I, we have a couple questions. One that relates to this question I asked was, what is lichen? Is the question. Is um, lichen is uh, algae and fungus uh, that are kind of like a, what, a science fiction creature that live in a symbiotic relationship that eat the rock. So they just live on the rock and eat it and they need the sun to grow. Mm -hmm. And then the other question is, um, are there groups of glyphs that are often found together or, or are the majority individual glyphs? Um, there's both. Uh, the majority of glyphs that we find together are often uh, bison and then like spears and atlatls. 
Uh, those would be the most common like grouping. Um, other groupings would be people. We find that a lot, but then there's a lot of standalones. Yeah, I thought it was amazing to see the the profile of a woman on the the rock. That I thought that was really interesting. I didn't realize that was a common, not not common, but not so rare that it was unheard of. <laughs> you know, it was amazing. Um, I guess one question, last question for me, and I'll keep an eye out to see if anything else comes through on the chat here. Um, it's, you want to just um, tell us about when people can visit the site in person? <laughs> you know, we really appreciate you taking the time to share this virtually with us. And beautiful, I'm sure it would be amazing to see it in person and folks who are here may make their, their next, you know, summer trip that way. Um, but I didn't know when, what's, what's the season it's open and uh, anything else that might be good advice if people were planning a trip. Yep, um, I'll answer that in a second. Um, I see somebody had a question about quarries. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there are quarries nearby. There's pipestone quarries um, with like in a mile of the site. And yes, that's the type of material people are using to make pipes from. Um, and there's a lot of other archeological and sacred features along the rock face. Um, when people can see uh, the carvings and come visit for the rest of this year, we have two weeks left um, of Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, 10 to 7, Sundays, noon to 5. And then after that, it goes to September to the weekends, um, 10 to 7. And then in October, we're open weekends, uh, 10 to 5. And then Indigenous Peoples Day is a free day. Otherwise, we'll pick back up in June. Um, and that'll be Thursday through Friday and Sunday again. Great. Thanks, David. Looks like one more question came through. Is First Woman same as Sky Woman? Uh, that I don't know. Okay. Definitely something to uh, do a little bit of research on, I guess. <laughs> um, all right, great. I think that's it for questions. I want to make sure we wrap up here. Uh, David, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, Again, beautiful, beautiful tour uh, to everybody watching. We'll share the recording later and you'll be able to watch it again on YouTube uh, and tell others about it um, and tell others about this beautiful site in Minnesota. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being here. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Have the rest of your days. <laughs> Bye.